Good evening. <laughs> thank you so much for coming. Um, we have a number of thank yous. Uh, a lot of people work to put this program on. Um, Executive Dean David Scobie at the New School for Public Engagement, the Nation Institute, Nation Books and Magazine, Haymarket Books, The Guardian, um, all sort of really work to, to make tonight possible. Uh, we obviously have a special thank you both to all of you who came out tonight and all of the people who are watching this. The event is being live streamed um, and it is also being taped by Book TV, for Book TV and Free Speech TV. Um, so I would ask to everybody to check their cell phones just to make sure that your cell phone is off. Um, and also just so you know that it is being filmed tonight. Um, we will be taking questions later um, and passing around note cards um, and then reading the questions from up here so that they can also be part of the live stream and the book TV. And there will be a book signing afterwards. Um, uh, Haymarket Books has a table and Gary will be signing books, so please join us afterwards. So this weekend I went to DC and I had a couple of extra hours and so I went to see the King Memorial. How many people have seen the King Memorial? It's exceedingly depressing. The original plans for the monument included alcoves to honor other civil rights martyrs, but those were scrapped for insufficient funds. King towers over us. The sculpture is flanked by a granite wall. 14 quotes are on that wall. Not one uses the word racism or segregation or racial injustice or apartheid, not one. They're arranged like cross stitches, 1963, 1967, 1955, 1963, 1964, completely out of context of the movements and mobilizations in which King spoke them. The monument was made in China to save money. A man who excoriated the triple evils of materialism, militarism, and racism who risked his life and went to jail 30 times to challenge the scourge of American racism, who was quick to point out the racism of the North as well as the South, who wrote from jail in 1963 that the biggest problem was not the Klan but the white moderate. That man of God and courage is now honored with a memorial that refuses to speak the problem of racism. It is into this moment, this moment when the history of the civil rights movement is regularly invoked and distorted and used to celebrate the greatness of the United States that we turn to our speakers tonight. Both of tonight's speakers write eloquently to help us make sense of this paradox, of these perilous times we live in where the history of one of the greatest social movements of the 20th century is used to imperil any urgency of the task of social justice today indeed to cover up at times the continuing scourge of materialism, militarism, and racism. And yet of the visions we can gain from a fuller and much richer sense of that history to help us see and work for justice in our time. Michael Denzel Smith is a blogger at thenation.com and a Nobler Fellow at the Nation Institute. He is also a freelance writer and social commentator, and his work has appeared in places such as The Guardian, Ebony, The Griot, The Root, and The Huffington Post. Gary Young is author, broadcaster, and award-winning columnist at The Guardian, uh, a monthly columnist at The Nation, and a Nobler Fellow at the Nation Institute. He has written four books. His fourth book, the speech, the story behind Martin Luther King's dream is why we are here tonight, as Gary gives us a bit of the fuller history of the March on Washington and then reflects on the current politics of, the, of this civil rights history and our recent se season of memorialization. So I'm gonna turn it over to Gary to kind of give us some introductory remarks and then Michael, and then we'll have some conversation up here and then we'll open it up to questions and conversation with you. Thank you. So, uh, thanks very much for coming. For those who've never seen me before, uh, uh, I'm Gary Young. For those who have seen me before, I'm Gary Young in a suit. Um, um, because this is uh, not a particularly familiar sight uh, unless you see me at a wedding or a funeral. So, um, uh, this, the book is called The Speech and it's about King's uh, uh, famous speech at the March on Washington. And if left there as an idea, then you have 
a great man and a great talk. But King could not do that on its own. The speech and the march came from somewhere. Uh, and um, I want to start by giving some context to that text. Because in the absence of that, there would have been no march and there would have been no speech. And so I start with kind of some of the people whose names perhaps we don't know, but who paid for that speech in a, in a range of ways. Um, I begin with Franklin McCain, who uh, was a 17-year-old in Greensboro, North Carolina, who made his stand by taking his seat at the Woolworths uh, downtown on February the 1st, uh, 1960. When I interviewed Franklin McCain, he, he said that up until that time, as a, a young man in North Carolina, he felt that his life was worthless and that his parents had lied to him. And the lie that they told him was a great American lie that you can be anything you want to be. And he said, as he grew through adolescence, he knew that wasn't true. As a 17-year-old black male in North Carolina, he knew that that wasn't true. And just as a symbol of how untrue that was, a completely different story that I was doing, several years later, I interviewed um, a guy called Buford Posey uh, from Mississippi, a white guy who became an anti-racist, who told me, quite kind of matter-of-factly, he said, I never knew that it was illegal to kill a black man until I joined the army. He said, um, until that time, I knew it was wrong, but I didn't know it was illegal. And true enough, in Mississippi, the people who were as likely as not to be killing black people were actually the law enforcement agencies. So it was not uh, an entirely incredible thing for him to think. So if we go back to Franklin McCain. He knows this as well as Buford Posey does. And he says he was angry at his parents for this lie. And so they sat up, him and his friends, late into the night, January the 31st, talking about how everybody had failed them before they talked themselves into the action that they took the following day, not knowing when they showed up at Woolworths in Greensboro whether any of the others would be there. He says, we wanted to go beyond what our parents had done, and the worst thing that could happen was that the Klan could kill us, but I had no concern for my personal safety. The day I sat at that counter, I had the most tremendous feeling of elation and celebration. I felt that in this life, nothing else mattered. If there's a heaven, I got there for a few minutes. I just felt you can't touch me. You can't hurt me. There's no other experience like it, not even the birth of my first child. A few years later, in May 63, in Birmingham, Alabama, a burly white police officer attempted to intimidate some black school children to keep them from joining the growing anti-segregation protests. They assured him they knew what they were doing, ignored his entreaties, and continued their march toward Kelly Ingram Park, where they were arrested. A reporter asked one of them her age. Six, she said, as she climbed into the paddy wagon. The following month in Mississippi, stalwart civil rights campaigner Fannie Lou Hamer overheard Anel Ponder, a fellow activist, being beaten in jail in an adjacent cell. Can you say yes, sir, nigger? Can you say yes, sir, the policeman demanded? Yes, I can, replied Ponder. So say it. I don't know you well enough, said Ponder. And then Hamer heard her head hit the floor again. The Polish journalist Ryszard Kapuscinski once wrote, all books about all revolutions begin with a chapter that describes the decay of tottering authority or the misery and sufferings of the people. But they should begin with a psychological chapter, one that shows how a harassed, terrified man suddenly breaks his terror and stops being afraid. This unusual process demands illuminating. Man gets rid of fear and feels free. The period preceding King's speech at the March on Washington was one such chapter. Until that point, there had, of course, been many fearless acts by anti-racist protesters. But in that moment, the number who were prepared to commit them reached a critical mass. In May 63, the New York Times published more stories about civil rights in two weeks than it had in the previous two years. During the 10-week period following Kennedy's address on civil rights in June that year, there were 758 demonstrations in 186 cities, resulting in 14,733 arrests. Such were the conditions that made the March on Washington possible and King's speech so resonant. And this context was global. Two days after McCain made his protest in Greensboro, the British Prime Minister Harold Macmillan addressed the South African Parliament in Cape Town with an ominous warning. The wind of change is blowing through this continent, he said, and whether we like it or not, this growth of national consciousness is a political fact. 
Some, including his immediate audience and apartheid parliament, didn't like it at all. But as the decade wore on, that wind became a gale. In the three years between Macmillan's speech and the march on Washington, the following countries became independent. Togo, Mali, Senegal, Zaire, Somalia, Benin, Niger, Burkina Faso, Côte d'Ivoire, Chad, Central African Republic, Congo, Gabon, Nigeria, Mauritania, Sierra Leone, Tanganyika, and Jamaica. Internationally, non-racial democracy and the black enfranchisement that came with it were the order of the day. The longer America practiced legal segregation, the more it looked like a slum on the wrong side of history than a shining city on the hill. Now, the story of that year in particular is the story of the base, the masses, the grassroots continually running ahead of the leadership. King spoke in Harlem just a few months before the march and was heckled by protesters shouting, we want Malcolm. When the NAACP hold their conference in Chicago, they invite Mayor Daley to give introductory remarks and he is heckled from the floor. When their leaders go to speak to Kennedy about holding the march, Kennedy says to them, we have legislation that's currently going through Congress. We, we would rather have new laws than have the Negroes out on the streets. And A. Philip Randolph, the socialist and trade union organizer who's primarily responsible for calling the march, tells Kennedy, the Negroes are already in the streets, Mr. President, and I doubt if you called them that they would come back. That is the mood of the moment, that the, um, the patience has worn out, the forbearance, the uh, ability to withstand the clubs and the hoses, hoses that can fire so strong, they can knock the bark off a tree at 30 feet being fired at children and dogs, has become too much. And so African Americans, who are always fighting back, start to resist like with like. In Birmingham, there is, um, eventually, they respond to the bombings uh, of the Klan with violence. And there's a fear, both among the civil rights leadership and among the Kennedy administration, that black people will resist and will meet like with like. That is the mood that creates a necessity for a march, which is called at the beginning of the year, but very few people want. The polls show that most, uh, most Americans don't want it, and particularly most white Americans don't want it. Kennedy doesn't want it. Um, it's uh, insufficiently radical for many of the youth and too radical for many of the more conservative leadership. But by the time it happens, there is a sense that uh, if they don't do this, then what are they gonna do to channel this frustration, uh, this mass frustration. And so the march happens. Now the key fear, primarily of the state, is that there will be violence. This is peculiar because most of the violence in the South has come from the white segregation, it's not from African Americans. But nonetheless, the fear is that there will be violence and so it is literally policed as a military operation. It's called Operation Steep Hill. 82nd Airborne, ready to fly up from North Carolina at a moment's notice and drop 19,000 troops on DC. A thousand uh, uh, troops in DC uh, deployed, 6,000 police uh, working, all leave canceled, all elective surgery canceled, baseball game canceled, alcoholic sales um, are made illegal, and even on the mic, the mic that King speaks from, there is a kill switch that the Justice Department put in surreptitiously. The idea is that if anybody calls for insurrection from the stage, that they will flip the switch and play Mahalia Jackson singing, he's got the whole world in his hands. That's their response. And so, it is uh, into that, um, into that uh, atmosphere that King plans uh, his Address. Now, King gave around 350 speeches that year. So if you take time off for high days and holidays, that's about a speech a day. And generally, he's not giving a bespoke speech. He's an African-American Baptist preacher. And in that tradition, he drafts his sermon, but then he crafts it in response to how the audience is taking to what he's saying. And he has a number of uh, 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 arsenal, a, a, a kind of a series of weapons that he can use, rhetorical uh, weapons. And, but the difference is that this speech, 
unlike other speeches, is going to be televised. If you were in the black church or the civil rights movement, you'd heard King speak before. But if you weren't, this was your oratorical, his oratorical introduction to the nation. Kennedy had never heard him give a speech before. And at the end of the speech, he turns to one of his aides in the Oval Office and says, damn, he's good. Um, and so King and his team want something that is going to be on a par with Gettysburg. Now, we know a lot of these details because the FBI were kind enough to record them uh, for us. He wants something on a par with Gettysburg. And so his, uh, one of his main aides, Wyatt T. Walker, says to King, don't do the I have a dream thing. It's trite. It's a cliche. You've used it too many times before. Uh, and that's the first line of the book. And indeed, King had used it many times before. He first recorded using of it was in 62. It's thought that he probably used it in 61. That's a couple of years before. He'd used it in June uh, at a rally in Detroit. And even a week earlier at a fundraiser for black insurance executives in Chicago. So this was not the first time that, by a long stretch, that he had used the I Have a Dream refrain. And King worries away at this speech. He seeks counsel. He has a lot of input, much more than he would generally. And what we know is that when he goes to bed at 4 o'clock in the morning, the morning of the march, I Have a Dream is not in the text of the speech that we know. Uh, and according to Clarence Jones, his lawyer, and uh, his speechwriter, it was not in King's mind to, to do that uh, uh, the next day. So the next day, there is a, a series of meetings they have with Congress. There's a funny kind of moment at the beginning of the day where um, they're in meeting Congress, and they come out, and the march has started without them, very symbolically, given what I've said earlier. Bayard Rustin, the uh, gay, ex-out gay, ex-communist, uh, conscientious objector, and that's before you get to the fact that he's black. He's the organizer of this march, and he runs out of Congress, sees the march leaving, and says, we are supposed to be leading them. They jump into their limousines and try to catch up with the march, but are blocked by the traffic, the traffic caused by the march that they themselves have called. And so they jump out of the, uh, of the limousines and they run to catch up with the march. And if you look at pictures of the leaders of the march, in a kind of Fred Flintstone version of photoshopping, what they did was basically just clear people out of the way so it looks as though they are at the front of the march, but actually they're in the middle. And throughout that day, King is worrying away at this text, scrawling all over it. If you look at the actual, what he ends up with, you know, what's left on the podium when he finishes speaking, there's, there's a, a, it's full of doodles and scrawls and so on. It was a hot day, 87 degrees at noon, and King is the 16th on a uh, agenda of 18. He's a 10th speaker. There's been the anthem, the invocation, the prayer. There have been a range of uh, a number of singers, including Mahalia Jackson, Peter, Paul, and Mary, Bob Dylan. A range of people have sung. And he, he, uh, he takes to the podium uh, about 2.30. And um, according to Clarence Jones, who uh, drafted much of the text, King keeps closer to this text than he would regularly keep. Um, those who wrote speeches for King said they were always King's speeches, basically. But you would be, in Clarence Jones's words, like a very crude architect. You would set up the four walls, and then King, like a beautiful interior designer, would come and he would make it his own. And King speaks very faithfully to uh, the main text. But then as, uh, and if you listen to the speech, um, and I would advise you to listen to it, it's the most popular, least well-known speech I've heard of. When I told my brother I was doing uh, this book, he said, I love that speech. It's such a great speech. You know, that thing about I've been to the mountaintop and I've seen the promised land, and I said, it's a great speech, but it's not that speech. And um, uh, he's winding up. He says, go back to Mississippi, go back to Louisiana, go back to South Carolina, go back to Alabama, go back to your northern homes and ghettos, knowing that somehow this situation will be resolved. Behind him is sitting Mahalia Jackson, a very, very close and special friend. When King was on the road, he would often call Mahalia Jackson for what they termed retail, uh, gospel therapy. He would call her and he would ask her to sing to him down the phone to soothe his spirit when he was down. 
And so he knew her well. He knew her voice well. He's winding down, go back to your northern homes and ghettos, knowing that somehow this situation will be resolved. And she shouts, tell him about the dream, Mum. Tell him about the dream. She had heard him deliver the dream segment in June in Detroit. King continues. For though we, uh, let us not wallow in the valley of, I say to you, my friends, let us, not, let us not wallow in the valley of despair. And then she shouts again, tell us about the dream, Martin. Tell us about the dream. And then in the words of Clarence Jones, King puts his text to the left of the podium. And in his body language changes from a lecturer to a preacher. And Jones turns to the person next to him and says, those people don't know it, but they're about to go to church. And then King says, uh, for though we face the difficulties of today and tomorrow, I still have a dream. At which point, Wyatt T. Walker, the man who advised him not to do that, who's in the crowd, turns to the person next to him and says, oh shit, he's doing the dream. <laughs> so um, that's how we got there. And what's interesting is that when you ask people who were there at the time and who knew King well, to a person they will tell you that they did not, of all the speeches that he made, this was not particularly one that they thought we would be talking about in 50 years' time. It was a great speech that none of them, you know, deny that. But many of them have different speeches that they thought uh, were better. And either way, they said great speeches was what King did. And so I spend a fair amount of time in the book looking at why that is. And I want to kind of really suggest two things here. The first is that, there is something for pretty much everybody in this speech. If you are an African-American, part of a community who's told that you are genetically stupid, that you're poor because you're stupid, that your stupidity is your responsibility, and that your, uh, the, the failings in your community have nothing to do with history and everything to do with you, then to know that the best speech, America's favorite speech, was delivered by an African-American in the black vernacular as an indictment of American racism is something to be very proud of. If you are a patriot, there is nothing in this speech that you need worry about. This is a dream deeply rooted in the American dream, literally and metaphorically delivered in the shadow of Lincoln that pays homage to the founding fathers, the Constitution and the Declaration of Independence. It's an American speech, couldn't have come from anywhere else. If you are progressive, this speech comes on this day. There have been few days like this for American prog progressives. Fair enough, only 20% of the crowd was white, which was less than what they were expecting. But nonetheless, this was the first march of its kind in Washington. Now, marches in Washington are two to a penny, but this mass demonstration, they hoped for 100,000, they got 250,000. Never been, uh, had never been done before. And it comes, and this is the way I describe it in, in the book, it is the most eloquent articulation of the last great moral act that America can claim for which there is any consensus, and that is the end of American apartheid. That um, whatever people say now, or feel able to say, nobody who wants to be take serious, taken seriously is calling for those signs to go back up. Nobody is calling for a return to formal codified segregation. And however small that may seem when we see the amount of racism that can still spew from the mouths of those who are elected or unelected, that is no small thing. The end of apartheid is a big thing. And it's, um, I, I believe it's the last great moral thing that America can really claim to have done as a country. So there is that. That num a number of people have something to claim, but there's also something else. King, when he delivers that speech, there is an even number of Americans with a favorable and unfavorable view of him. By 66, twice as many Americans have an unfavorable view than a favorable view. By, and then he's dead in 68, assassinated. By 1999, when Americans are polled on who are their favorite characters of the 20, 20th century, King comes second only to Mother Teresa. So something happens between when he is assassinated as a somewhat marginal and polarized figure and 1999. And this is what I think has happened. First of all, why does he become unpopular? Well, when 
The speech is delivered. The year after comes the Civil Rights Act. The year after that comes the Voting Rights Act. Legislation begins to kick in. And King understands that the end of segregation is not the same as the beginning of equality. As he says, I have given people, we have won the right to eat in any restaurant of our choice, but we do not have the ability to eat everything that's on the menu because we can't afford it. And so he starts talking about what else is necessary. And I want to read you this bit from where do we go uh, from here. And you get a sense of why he might become unpopular. He says, there are 40 million people, poor people here, and one day we must ask the question, why are there 40 million poor people in America? And when you begin to ask that question, you are raising questions about the economic system, about a broader distribution of wealth. When you ask that question, you begin to question the capitalistic economy. And I'm simply saying that more and more, we've got to begin to ask questions about the whole society. We are called upon to help the discouraged beggars in life's marketplace, but one day, we must come to see that an edifice which produces beggars needs restructuring. It means that questions must be raised. You see, my friends, when you deal with this, you begin to ask the question, who owns the oil? You begin to ask the question, who owns the iron ore? You begin to ask the question, why is it that people have to pay water bills in a world that is two-thirds water? Now, that kind of talk in America in 1967 will get you killed. And sure enough, a year later, he is killed. So he starts talking about capitalism. Year after that, uh, in 67, he starts at the Riverside Church. He calls America the greatest purveyor of military violence in the world today and takes a stand against the Vietnam War. Now, how is America then going to remember King? Well, it can't remember him if it's going to raise him to iconic status, if it's going to put him on the mall, then it has to sanitize him for public consumption. It has to make him the kind of person who could come second to Mother Teresa. And you can't do that with a man in America who questions capitalism. Because to remember King in that way would not raise him above the fray, it would enter him into it. it that's what this shutdown was all about. That's what they, they just cut people's food stamps today. You can't remember King as a man who criticized capitalism and still hold him up as an American uh, icon. That doesn't work unless what it takes to be an American icon changes. You can't remember him. America can't remember him the powers that be, is the man who called America the greatest purveyor of military violence in the world today, because arguably it still is. And it was notable on the 50th anniversary of the speech, it took place literally on a split screen. And on one screen, there was Obama, Clinton, Carter, carrying King's mantle, cloaking themselves in his legacy. And on the other screen, will we bomb Syria? When will we bomb Syria? Why wouldn't we bomb Syria? You can't remember King as that, have him on the mall, and still claim him to be an American icon when he's speak, speaking about America being the greatest purveyor of military violence. But you can remember him as a man who got rid of American apartheid. Not American racism, because that would involve a whole different set of conversations about why black men in DC have a lower life expectancy rate than men on the Gaza Strip. You can't have that conversation, but you can have the conversation about why or how he got rid of uh, American uh, apartheid. Uh, and so that's the way that they choose to remember him. And so I, I, I end with just one paragraph where I talk about the process by which King and through him the speech can be sanitized. And they say white America, most of it, came to embrace King in the same way that most white South Africans came to accept Nelson Mandela. Grudgingly and gratefully. Retrospectively, selectively, without grace, but with considerable guile. By the time they realized their dislike of him was spent and futile, he'd created a world in which admiring him was in their own self-interest. Because, in short, they had no choice. When it comes to King and his speech, one of the central arguments in this book is it's not just about what you remember, it's also about what you forget. Thank you.
Uh, good evening. Um, uh, before I get started, I want to spend, send a uh, special shout out to the second U.S. Circuit Court of Appeals uh, for reminding us all that the work ain't over. Um, but I would like them to know we will win. Um, I, I grew up in a Malcolm X household. Uh, my introduction to Malcolm X was probably, I was like four or five, and my father, who kind of favors Malcolm X, portrayed him in a, a Black History Month uh, special uh, play or some, some sort. Um, there was Malcolm X literature all over the household. Uh, I still have on my nightstand right now a copy of the autobiography that my father had, the, the broken and tattered one. Uh, I grew up post Public Enemy and Spike Lee resurrecting Malcolm X in his iconography. Uh, my father had several X hats and, and T-shirts. Um, I say all that to say that uh, Dr. King is not a part of my foundation. Uh, I don't have any particular attachment or reverence, or didn't have, uh, because I rejected him. I, I accepted the binary idea that you either choose Malcolm or you choose Martin. Um, I mean, we, I just don't have much uh, contact with, with Martin Luther King Jr. I mean, we had a picture of him in our house like most black Americans do. Um, you will find Malcolm X, Martin Luther King, and Jesus, uh, and now Barack Obama. Uh, it's actually, that's actually uh, the barbershop I used to go to, there are only three pictures on the wall. There are Martin Luther King Jr., Malcolm X, and Barack Obama. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, the picture in our household was Malcolm X in the center, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad to his right, and then Martin Luther King. So I, I just don't have a whole lot of you know, emotional pull to the legacy of Dr. King. Um, but I, I realize that's not entirely my fault. Uh, you know, I, did, I didn't even grow up celebrating Martin Luther King Jr. holiday because I grew up in Virginia. And in Virginia, we had Lee Jackson King Day where we celebrated Robert E. Lee Stonewall Jackson and Martin Luther King Jr. on the same day. Um, it's a big day. <laughs> right. It's, it's a deal. It was. It was uh, make it a week. It, it, and that lasted until the year 2000. Like, this is very. <laughs> they celebrated Lee Jackson King Day until the year 2000. And, you know, and this goes to what Gary was just speaking about. How can you do that? How can you lump Martin Luther King Jr. in with Robert E. Lee and Stonewall Jackson? Well, you, you depoliticize him. Uh, you rob him of his actual legacy. You rob him of the words that he spoke and wrote and the fight that he fought during his lifetime. And you can do whatever you want with him. Uh, but I mean, Martin Luther King is not alone in this, right? We depoliticize everyone. We depoliticize American history. Uh, when you're, you're a country as arrogant as the United States uh, to claim that you are the greatest nation on the face of the earth uh, in history, uh, you need a, a history, a narrative of history to match that claim. And so everything becomes depoliticized and everything becomes a symbol of American exceptionalism. So this is why you can have people on both the right and the left uh, praising both FDR and Ronald Reagan and not see the, the inconsistencies of, the, you know, of that uh, because they're not political figures anymore. They are symbols. They, they represent the greatness of the United States of America. And so that's what King has come to represent, even as he was fighting against pretty much everything that America stands for. Uh, but I mean, we can look at the March on Washington itself that, that brought us the dream speech. We know the full name of the March on Washington. It's not, it, it's the March on Washington for jobs and freedom. You can't talk about and commemorate the March on Washington for jobs and freedom right now and if you don't want to talk about what freedom means when you're in a country that incarcerates more than two million people. But you can if it's just the March on Washington. So you can't talk, you, you can't commemorate a man uh, who, as Gary was saying, talked about 
America as the greatest purveyor of uh, violence internationally and wage perpetual war. You can't do that. Uh, you can't talk about uh, Martin Luther King Jr. and erect a statue in his memory and this man stood against police brutality and every 28 hours in this country, a black person is shot and killed by police or security or some vigilante. You can't do it. But you can if you reduce the man to a dream. And if that dream is so, um, it's such a blank slate that you can project on it whatever you want to. And th that's not the fault, that's not King's fault. He was delivering a speech that he needed to deliver at the time, but the problem with our, our, our understanding of race and racism in America being confined to that one moment and be confined to that one idea of having a dream that little black boys and little white boys will hold hands together uh, means that we don't deal with what racism actually is. We don't deal with the fact that the governing philosophy for the United States of America since its inception has been white supremacy. We, we don't have to deal with it because you know, well, all we had was a dream that we would be nice to one another. Uh, so what, what I appreciate about Gary's book and you know, also Jean's book about Rosa Parks is that we are rescuing these figures and their legacies from this narrative of American exceptionalism. So I guess one place I thought we could start and that both of you touched on was the kind of, you know, what we saw in August around the 50th anniversary commemoration, and both of you have written about this. And then I think, I think both of you just touched on what became a kind of self congrat a national self-congratulation that I think we, we saw in August. And if you could kind of tease that out a little bit more. Yeah, I mean, it was a show, really. And <clears throat> um, there's a part of me that, thinks, okay, I mean, it's a 50th anniversary. There should be some kind of show. I mean, there should be a commemoration. But then that show has to mean something. And what that show cannot do is bastardize the, uh, and traduce the original meaning of, of what happened. And so, uh, I mean, interestingly, in the run-up to, uh, to the march, um, Bayard Rustin... And the organizers made a whole load of concessions. There was going to be an unemployed speaker. They were going to march around the White House. And they kept making concessions. And the young people in the, uh, in the office would go, sell out, sell out, every time they did. And they'd say, look, we have this coalition to keep together, the coalition of unions, civil rights leaders, and church leaders. And so these concessions are important. But the one concession he would not make was that politicians should not speak from the platform. He said, they are there to listen to us, not to lecture us. And um, what was telling at the, you know, at the, I went to one of them, was, you know, hearing Nancy Pelosi and, I mean, Eric Holder got 20 minutes. He's the America's chief cop. He gets 20 minutes. And Julian Bond gets his mic cut off at two. And that is not just symbolic. That is real. That's kind of, a, and it tells you something about, um, uh, about priorities and about um, uh, trajectory. So there was, um, uh, so there was, there was that. And then the other thing that I found, there were lots of things I found curious, including there was a McDonald's, you know, sponsored by McDonald's stand. Uh, the M MSNBC, um, they did a lot of stuff on the speech, and that was sponsored by Bank of America, which has been, you know, kicking people, kicking black people out of their homes since 1933. You know, you were kind of <laughs> looking forward to that, kind of being on their, uh, uh, on their, on their rider. And um, uh, was that they kept saying again and again, you know, we've come a long way, but we have further to go. And you think, well, who should we look to for that? I mean, you are the, you're the president, you're the leaders, you're to do something about it. I mean, it was, there was this sense of like, huh, you know, who would have thought? <laughs> 50 years, 50 years after the March on Washington, the discrepancy between black and white unemployment is the same. The discrepancy between black and white incarceration, income and wealth has grown. There are more people in prison now than were, uh, were in the Soviet gulag at its height. And these people are like, 
What are you going to do? <laughs> and I'm thinking, what are you going to do? I would like to know what you're going to do. And so uh, the degree to which there is this sense of kind of powerlessness among the powerful, I found quite objectionable. One interesting thing I saw, just pictorially was, or visually, was the number of the main, um, not poster, but T-shirt or whatever that you saw on that march was Trayvon Martin. Mm. And there was an interesting variation on that, which was Obama in a hoodie, which was the sense I, I got of like, look, you know, I don't think when George Zimmerman saw Trayvon Martin walking down the road, he thought there goes a the future president of America, you know. And um, uh, I, f I found that interesting that that was where people, that, I saw more pictures of Trayvon Martin than I did of Martin Luther King. Uh, we had two. We had yeah. two marches. I only went to one. We, 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 like stand. we, we had two <laughs> commemorations, and the the one led by uh, the Reverend Al Sharpton, who I have immense respect for. I do, but uh, it was telling to me that uh, young Ashawn Johnson from Chicago, who's a, you know the the young education activist, was taken off the stage. Um, because it, it, it's telling because as much as we talk about youth and as much as we want our youth involved and we want to, to see youth movements, we're, we're taking the mic away from them. We're taking them, we're taking them out of the fight. Um, and that to me was the, the, the theme of Al Sharpton's march essentially was that, uh, you know, it, it, was, it was his ascension, it was his, uh, coronation as the single uh, most powerful civil rights leader in the the United States at the moment and that uh, you know you essentially go through him um, and it, it 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 was it's disheartening to watch but at the very least um, Philip Agnew of the Dream Defenders did get to speak at that uh, commemoration which he did not at the the official one he and Sophia Campos were told that they were not going to get their two minutes a piece because there was they ran out of time and that to me that that this was the real farce on Washington as Malcolm X called the original March this was a farce on Washington this was not about uh, movement this was not about uh, the actual lived experiences of black and brown oppressed people in this country. This is not about finding solutions. This is about America patting itself on the back for how far we've come. And if we look at the statistics that Gary Young ha has rattled off, like how far have we come? Like, tell me, please, I would like to know. Um, if you'll indulge my Michael Eric Dyson moment, I'd like to quote a rapper real quick. Um, you know, most deaf said, you know, we start keeping pace, you start changing up the tempo. I mean, what, what exactly are we supposed to do when at every turn you introduce new forms of racism? You, you, you change the game up completely and, and it doesn't look anymore like whites only signs, but there, you know, it looks like being locked up for a dime bag of weed. You know, this, I mean, this is the new fight. This is, this is the new way that they've chosen to oppress. So what are the solutions? but we don't get any at this, you know, commemoration. This isn't, because it's not about movement and I don't have time for that. Um, right, I mean, I want us to talk a little bit more about this image of the split screen, right? And uh, just to bring in my, my, I always like to bring everything back to Rosa Parks, right? In <laughs> the end of February, right, we got the statue. Um, and you may remember, it's like a bipartisan, it's an odd moment of bipartisanship, right? It's McConnell, it's, you know, it's Boehner, it's Nancy Pelosi, and the president, right, come to the Capitol to, you know, honor the very first statue of a black person in the Capitol. And uh, Barack Obama, when Parks dies, uh, says, you know, we need more than lofty words, right? So here we are, Barack Obama's the president. It's 2013. We need more than lofty words. Literally across town that day as they're honoring that statue, as they're talking about what a great nation, what a vision, what a people, what a country, across town, the Supreme Court is hearing the Voting Rights Act challenge, literally across town, and President Obama ends the day and he talks about her singular act of courage. The President of the United States, who could do more than lofty words, 
who had said that was what it meant to honor Rosa Parks when she died, has that opportunity and again gives us lofty words. And so I guess I wanted us to talk more about the split screen. I think that there is, um, America has this ability far, a f far more potent ability than say Britain, which is where I'm from, if you hadn't guessed, um, has to discharge the past and to, to travel light from its, uh, from its history. Britain kind of slips into its past like an old man in a warm bath, you know, it kind of surrounds itself with it and it likes the idea of it and it, and it's, you know, and it kind of, uh, like a, you know, a warm bath after a while, it's kind of pretty disgusting and, <laughs> and, um, and people are very comfortable with it, you know, so people say like, uh, um, you know, um, what is it people say? They say, like, this is a great, you know, putting a great back into Great Britain. <laughs> and you're like, well, how did the great get into Great Britain, actually? A whole lot of genocide, a whole lot of war. A whole Stop bringing up old stuff. You know, don't, we don't want to talk about that. You know, God save the Queen. Um, look at those lovely castles. And um, whereas America has this ability to kind of, even as the March on Washington was taking place, America was reinventing itself and saying there was a group from the um, whatever the propaganda agency is that, that works with the um, uh, State Department and they were filming the marches to make a little program to send to Africa about American democracy at work. Using the march on Washington, a march for democracy, a march by people who had just been horse whipped and, uh, and beaten and hosed to say, what a great country this is. So that's kind of like rewriting history while the ink is still dry. It's not yet dry on the first, uh, on the first draft. And so there is this uh, uncanny ability here in a way that I haven't seen in other places, though I don't doubt it exists, to kind of deny what is right in what is on the other screen, to kind of, to have a sort of bipolar sense of what's going on. So, um, uh, to say you can see from Barack Obama's election that African Americans are getting on. And then you just quote kind of almost any statistic that shows that actually his ascent has coincided with the descent of the large number, a large number of African Americans. And it's like, yeah, but isn't this wonderful? Right. But it, yeah, okay, yeah. You know, and um, you barely ever get to the end of the sentence. And so, and what that means with racism is a desire which was explicitly stated in the um, arguments, either that day or before or after, where um, um, the person arguing to gut the Voting Rights Act said, this is for a problem that has been solved that the problem's been solved. And that racism becomes signs, becomes only the systematic, that you need Jim Crow Senior with uh, um, a pointy hat and a burning cross and a billy club, that's racism. Whereas Jim Crow Junior, who, you know, they denied all paternity, but he's still there, and he doesn't use cuss words, he dresses very politely, and he works within a system that keeps white supremacy going by pushing paper around in a certain way and by locking people up in a certain way and saying, well, just these are the rules. And so there is this sense that the, the systematic is a lot easier to understand and to see and a lot easier to portray, and people are more comfortable with it. Whereas the systemic, once you pull at that, you have to pull at class, you have to pull at capitalism, you're pulling at... The, the, the entire way in which, as Michael said, America has been structured and uh, the way in which uh, it operates. And uh, I was gonna say no one, but I think that, I mean, I actually think that's not true, but those who own the screens don't wanna show that screen. Right. That's not in their interest to show that screen. Yeah. What Gary said. <laughs> 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 um, I think, we're going to take some questions. 
I guess before we take a question, um, so Gary, I've heard you talk about this and like to think about what if we remembered that speech, not as the high of a dream speech, but the bad check speech. Mm. So, you know, I think part of this is also what would it mean to remember King right through sort of different things that were as important to his rhetorical yeah. presence. Yeah. And I, I want to back up uh, also on something that Michael said, because I, I, I didn't grow up in a Malcolm X household, largely because I grew up in England, a Caribbean family. But I did grow up with more affinity towards what I thought Malcolm X was mm. than what I thought King was. Mm. And it was partly in the same way, uh, if this sounds trite, then I'm sorry. But when, when I started, I grew up with Bob Marley. And when I started seeing white people whose racial politics I distrusted kind of rocking out to Bob Marley, I kind of thought, I don't really like Bob Marley anymore. <laughs> it's kind of, you ruined it for me. And it took me to be outside of that context. Mm -hmm. Actually, you know, that he can sing. And it's, uh, it's good. And uh, you can't blame him. Uh, you can't blame him for that. And, that. and that does speak to the speech because one of the ways, and a few people said this, why don't we know it as a bad check speech? So, so in the speech, there's a moment at which, quite a long moment, where King talks about America has issued the Negro a bad check. And we have come to cash this check that was marked insufficient funds. And if you understand it as a bad check speech, then it does bring the issues up to date in a way that the dream, which is a vision, a utopian vision, and I like it because it's a utopian vision, does not. That it says, where's ours? When are you going to come good on this check? No one can walk around the jails and the the schools and so on and say America has honored that check. And the, the, the metaphor is that with the um, uh, Declaration of Independence, I think, or the Constitution, Americans said that uh, all men, yes, black men and white men were created equal. That's the check that was written and it keeps bouncing. And when one understands America's racial history in that way, it does do different things to what that, how that speech can be remembered, not just as kumbaya, you know, can't we all get along? But um, there has to be, and I'm not specifically talking about reparations here, but like there has to be a redistribution of wealth. There has to be, you have to make good on what you say it means to be American because you have not done that yet. And um, uh, that is a very different way of understanding that speech. Also, he starts by saying, 200 years ago, in, this, in the shadow of the man in which we stand. And he talks about the legacy of slavery and segregation in a way that makes it very, very clear that there is more to freedom than the breaking of chains. That there is more to equality than simply the end of segregation. And so when people take the judge by the, color, judge by the content of their character, not the color of their skin, and they use that as the flight from history, that's the only line conservatives know of that whole speech. And they use that to oppose affirmative action and all the rest of it. It ignores the fact that he says racism has a legacy and the present has consequences and we are living with that legacy. And what conservatives particularly, but I think quite often America as a fairly conservative country likes to do is to pretend that the past has no legacy. So even to take a different example, but it makes the point somewhat clearer, when you talk about the bombing of Syria and you say, well, what about the bombing of Iraq? And people are like, why are you bringing up old stuff? And it's like, it's not old stuff, it's still going on. <laughs> or why, you know, you talk about the failures in Afghanistan and they say, just because we've, you know, just because the last war didn't work doesn't mean this one can't. And you're like, that war's not over. You're still fighting that war. You know, you haven't finished your kind of main course and you're already on a dessert. Like, slow down. And think about what think about what you're uh, think about what you're doing, and so there is there are a range of ways in which that speech is even on its own terms, and on its own terms it was not a radical speech, even on its own terms it's traduced. Yeah, I was going to ask if we start a thing where we get this to be called the bad check speech. Does that mean I finally get my reparations check? But I <laughs> you, you've seen the you've seen the um, Dave Chappelle 
Yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. yes. <laughs> <laughs> you can have it. Just don't go to KFC. <laughs> oh, no. No. And then, of course, my fantasy is it would be called the white moderate speech because um, my favorite passage from King is that passage in Letter from Birmingham Jail where he talks about the greatest stumbling block to freedom is not the Klan, but the white moderate who prefers order to justice, mm. um, who feels he can set a timetable for another man's freedom, who paternalistically says to wait, right, for a more convenient season. Yeah. And if we have that King, right, the work is not done, right? Mm. Um, I mean, there is, I mean, related to that, there is this interesting, I think, way of understanding it, which is if you, if you think of how unpopular King was when he died, and then you look at other people who are unpopular and other things that are unpopular now, and how King shifts from being second only to Mother Teresa to being deeply unpopular, mm. then, it's a kind of useful way of understanding, well, who are we excluding at this moment? What, yeah. what issues, what characters, what platforms are we deciding are completely unpalatable now that in 50 years' time are going to get something on the mall and, and it's going to be kind of so obvious that Bank of America are going to sponsor it? Right, right. I mean, just to right, remember how unpopular he is, right? When he gives the Riverside speech, the New York Times runs an op-ed the next day with the headline, Dr. King's Error. The Washington Post runs an article, right? Only 25% of African Americans agree with King after that speech. That doesn't even get us to white Americans, right? So that is a, right, exceed, like, the degree of unpopular, I think we forget. And then, like Gary's saying, right, the, the need for us then to reflect on who is unpopular and what that message may mean for where we need to go. I mean, we can reflect on who's popular in, in the same way. I mean, what, what's going to happen with Barack Obama? What, what is going to happen with the way that we remember his legacy? We're going to, again, congratulate ourselves for electing the first black president and then reelecting him, but we're not going to remember his legacy in any way uh, that, that I feel is, is accurate as to what he's, what, what he's actually accomplished. And what has he accomplished? I mean, we're talking about uh, health care, a Republican idea that it will you know, be a boon to uh, insurance companies. Uh, we're talking about the continuation of the wars that were started in, during the Bush years and, and uh, you know, ingraining again this mindset of perpetual war and using drones and expanding that, that warfare. I, I mean, we're talking about, uh, uh, you know, again, mass incarceration we're talking about that and the, the I mean, his, his administration has fought the war on, continued to fight the war on drugs in much the same way that other administrations have fought it, even though they don't call it the war on drugs. I mean, we're, are we going to remember these things? Are we going to, again, exalt someone because of what we can find to, uh, you know, further the narrative of American exceptionalism and not reckon with their actual legacy? And what I think, particularly uh, your book, and I hope, and my book is about, is trying to, I think that those are always open contests that we're involved in, that we should be involved in, and that it's never too late and never too early to challenge the dominant narrative. And that um, there is a dialectic takes place between the dominant thesis and, and the range of uh, antitheses and it's just very important to be in that struggle because it's not just the intention of writing this book isn't just about understanding a historical moment. It's about challenging how we understand history because under how we understand history has a direct relation to how we understand where we are now. Mm. And so that is, I consider that an open, an open fight and a fight kind of uh, w worth, worth waging. There was a, a funny thing. I was in Belfast last week uh, at a festival, and I was being interviewed on the radio. It was a very quick interview. I got my kind of 45 seconds of talking, and then the, the woman's wrapping it up, and she just said, 
And Barack Obama is now, uh, you know, and now lives on as a legacy of Dr. Martin Luther King. Thanks very much for having you on the show. <laughs> and uh, it's effortless. It's, it's, um, it's, um, it's like arsenic in the water supply. So you're never going to get it all. But, um, uh, but you have to, you, you, you know, you, you have to try. Um, so let me read our uh, first question. Um, this person writes, if the dream was an attractive metaphor for the end of apartheid, what would constitute a useful metaphor for the end of contemporary white supremacy? Uh, and then a second question, what is today's hopeful revolutionary statement commensurate with I have a dream? Or sort of a... Wow. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, you can take that. So, yeah. <laughs> so if the question Cheers. is, can I come up with a, a metaphor to match a metaphor that's lasted 50 years? Yeah. Then the answer yeah, is Yeah, Gary, no. get to it. Yeah. yeah exactly. We're waiting. Slack. I'm so slack. <laughs> come on. Um, uh, I mean, one of the things that's worth worth questioning actually is given the way that's been misappropriated was that a, was that the greatest metaphor mm -hmm. i mean um that it wasn't the only metaphor he used absolutely it was the metaphor that was uh was remembered mm -hmm. um and um <clears throat> i i i do think that the stage that we're in now neoliberal globalization in all of its forms a systemic as opposed to a systematic more systemic as opposed to a systematic form of racism <clears throat> doesn't lend itself easily to, uh, uh, to metaphors. Mm -hmm. That it's, um, uh, and that's kind of been one of our challenges. I mean, the, the, the 1%, 99% meme was a useful framing, I thought, for a while. It wasn't about race, but it kind of captured the sense of like, uh, <clears throat> The, uh, a framing of the of the of the problem that people do uh, kind of go back to, but even that um, w wasn't in, entirely, you know, wasn't entirely uh, adequate. But um, yeah, I I can't match the dream. If mm -hmm. I, I if I could, I probably wouldn't be sitting here right now. Mm -hmm. uh, and none of us will be around for the end of white supremacy, so I don't even think we should bother, uh, you know, trying to rack our brains for a metaphor to <laughs> to sum it up. Uh, yeah, it will uh, be yay, <laughs> right? <laughs> <laughs> um, but as far as you know, catchy slogans go, I, I, the only one that I uh, will endorse, uh, and I'm going back to the Dream Defenders again, and excuse me, but I just love the work that they're doing. Um, they just they just say over and over again, I believe that we will win, and that's it. Which is the version, the, the AMC's slogan, one of the many slogans was, victory is certain, mm -hmm. which w was a very powerful, I mean, given how unlikely it was at so many, uh, uh, at so many points. But I think that the, the point you make there, which is that it's very difficult to imagine what the end of white supremacy would look like, actually. Right. And um, um, that doesn't mean that it's not worth trying. No. And what I like about the dream segment, actually, is its utopian nature, that within 10 days, four little girls have been killed in Birmingham at Sunday school. And yet there's this guy, he didn't get up and say, I have a 10-point plan. Yeah. You know, he was like, look, we can, we can do better. We can be better. We, you know, this, this is not all... Uh, all, all we uh, all we have to be, but <clears throat> we're not even. We haven't even reached the point of his dream yet. So, kind of uh, going on to like what the next dream would be. Like, let's let's kind of let's wake up from the nightmare that we're in now and kind of uh, and, and get to the end of that one first. Right. I mean, I think King over and over again in the letter from Birmingham Jail and many of his later speeches talks about the myth of time, right? And that really talks against this idea that things just get better and better mm -hmm. and progress and progress. And he, you know, I think we forget this part of King that says time is neutral. Time, it, you know, we're, you know, it, it, for time, for things to get better, it requires us to act. Mm. And this idea that if we just, you know, at, be patient and be quiet, that America or the world is just getting better, I mean, King says over and over is a myth, and that he, in fact, says that the voices of, of opposition are better at using time than we are. And so I think, I don't know, I was reading the letter again this week and was struck by 
by that. Um, we have a question here that says, are there any other famous historical figures who are critical of capitalism and who have been depoliticized? Must be. Um, <clears throat> um, in America? Well, uh, they don't say so, but I think that's maybe the implication. I don't know. Um, I, I would look for some help from the audience, actually. No? Can I phone a friend? <laughs> I mean, I do think... I do think that theme in the civil rights movement is really taken out of how we talk about the movement, yeah? No, 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 go ahead. You're my friend. Oh, there is. It's for the TV. Yeah. Um, maybe W.B. Du Bois in regards to, or maybe that's more just an attention thing in regards to him not being talked about constantly through the mainstream as, mm. you know, other figures and whatnot because of that. Right. So, yes, W.B. Du Bois, who actually, interestingly, dies on the day of the march. Mm. Um, and uh, there is, uh, for those of you who don't know, Du Bois joins the Communist Party very late in his life. Um, and <clears throat> dies on the day of the march. And Roy Wilkins... Uh, who is the head of the NAACP, is asked, A. Philip Randolph asks him, will you read out, you know, uh, commemorate? And Wilkins says no, because Du Bois was a communist. And it's only when uh, um, Randolph says, if you don't do it, I'm going to do it, and I'll take up your time, that then Wilkins kind of um, uh, uh, does, uh, does agree um, I do think that, I mean, there are people who are forgotten. So Bayard Rustin is forgotten. Mm. Uh, Rosa Parks is certainly uh, misremembered. I don't know what her <clears throat> position on capitalism is, but I do know that she was not, when asked about um, her position, King, in relation to Malcolm, she's like, I could never get to the nonviolent. You know, I, I was always much more a believer in, in Malcolm's strategy mm. than King's, or at least she could not, she, she was never, she could never quite devote herself to the notion of, um, uh, of, uh, of nonviolence, um, really. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I don't, I don't know if there are any other figures that are critical of capitalism and depoliticized. Yeah, not I mean, I think one. I mean, Sorry? Muhammad Ali would be right. Muhammad Ali would be a good example. Gloria, I mean, also Gloria Richardson. Um, so one of the things we haven't mentioned yet tonight is sort of how much sort of both women participated and organized to, for the march, and then were in many ways uh, shunted aside. And one of the people who was on the dais that day was Gloria Richardson. Uh, who was waging the struggle in Cambridge, Maryland. And it was a struggle that was very much linking racial injustice um, on the eastern shore of Maryland with economic justice. Um, and uh, Richardson, like the other women on the dais that day, did not get to speak. Um, there's an amazing interview that Democracy Now! did with Gloria Richardson mm -hmm. um, the week of the March commemoration sort of where she talks about both what, they're, th what they were doing in Cambridge, uh, but also um, literally sort of being recognized that day on the dais and, and sort of getting to say hello and the, um, yeah. the microphone being taken away from her. Um, but I do think sort of Richardson is emblematic of, I think, many local civil, like what we might say civil rights leaders or black freedom struggle leaders who were, who always had a kind of um, core of economic justice. And I think what we tend to remember is the public desegregation. Mm -hmm. And that was certainly part of that struggle, um, but that there was all of these other economic struggles woven sort of through that. And so, um, but again, Gloria Richardson, um, mm. I would be one that I would, I would put out there. Mandela. Mandela had a critique of capitalism. I mean, he didn't implement it once he was uh, in power, unfortunately. Um, well, I was a big mistake. It was also a different world to, than the one that, I mean, I, th I, um, 
I would not have liked to have taken over South Africa no. at that moment. Not that anybody asked, but um, um, uh, but you know, the Freedom Charter was um, the call for mass nationalisation and a, 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 a whole range of things. And while um, Mandela's he said his favorite form of democracy was British parliamentary democracy, which is itself kind of odd, but um, economically he was, uh, he was a socialist. He is a, uh, a socialist, and uh, I don't think we'll be seeing much of that uh, when he passes. Um, one of the things that kept him in prison for an awful long time was the fact that he refused to renounce any association with the Communist Party. Um, so um, uh, Mandela would be would be another one who's understood as a nice old man, right. yeah. you know, who did the right I, thing. I, I would I, I I agree that Malcolm X obviously had the, the critique of capitalism, but uh, they have to want to remember you to depoliticize you. Mm. Right. Um, we got a live stream question. Um, so uh, this person asks, is there still a generation who remembers the fight of all these leaders? How can we instill interest in new generations for them? Uh, you know, how do you instill interest in young people to want to learn history? Um, <laughs> I think you have to, you have to relate it to them. Um, it has to be tangible and it has to mean something to your present, you know? Uh, and I think that's, uh, what you find with, with a lot of, uh, youth activism today is they're tied to and understand history and that's why they're out in the streets um, because they understand that uh, for them to have what freedom they have now someone struggled for it but they also understand that that fight uh, didn't complete the struggle uh, that they have uh, a responsibility to take up that mantle now um, and it simply is because someone along the way expressed that to them. And someone, you know, when they put that, that copy of Asada Shakur's biography in their hands, they were like, this is, this is your history. This is who you are. This is how you got here. Um, you simply, yeah, I mean, every, every time you want to, people are like, how do we do this with the youth? I mean, have you ever just tried talking to them? Like, they're not aliens that you, like, that don't understand the way that you speak or that, that don't understand words. They, they are intelligent beings. I mean, you can talk to young people. Yeah. I, I implore you, I'll talk to young people. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I, I actually find young people very receptive. I mean, first of all, lots of people are still alive because uh, it wasn't that long ago. That's one of the very important things to remember. 50 years is not that long, actually. If my six-year-old son wants to know about segregation and signs and whatnot, which, you know, he's around that age, I can just point him to his grandfather and his grandmother. His grandmother saw King speak in Philadelphia. His grandfather grew up in Atlanta. Both of them grew up in the South. This is, this is living history. Uh, and uh, really to back up what Michael said, young people are not kind of, um, I think they have a very keen interest in history and there are two reasons I think why the way in which it's presented to them can be a turn off. One is these people did all this, what are you doing? Mm -hmm. You useless bunch of people, <laughs> you know, where's yeah. your Rosa Parks, where's your, I marched you got your pants hanging down and are listening to rap music exactly. and like, uh, and so then we get arrested when we buy belts. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and so there is this, there is this sense that, um, of history being used as a stick yes. to beat young people with, um, that, uh, that in a sense, they are not worthy of the history that they have, uh, uh, been bequeathed. And secondly, that if you tell history as a series of stories about great men and very occasionally great women, mm. and you put people up on pedestals, then you can't reach them. Yeah. And so it becomes just a, kind of another version of a world that you're not a part of, which was the point of that, um, that first bit that I read, was like, these are ordinary people. These are six-year-old kids. These are people whose names you don't know who were fighting, and the history is made by people, not by, in order for King to deliver that speech, 
there had to be a march. In order for there to be a march, there had to be 14,733 arrests in 10 weeks. That's a lot of people. And that person could be you. You could be part of what makes that speech. And um, if it's an ego thing and you want to give the speech, that's a different thing. But if you want to be, if you want to understand uh, how that speech actually happened, it happened because people made it happen and your people. And so it does depend on how you tell history. And the most revolutions, social and political revolutions, are actually led by the young. And so there are very few stories, um, regardless of where, where it is, it's in Cuba or Russia or Germany or whatever, where young people aren't front and center, including this story, right. where Birmingham changes everything, and G Birmingham is young people. And so um, uh, making history accessible, not in easy words, just, but as something that, is, that you can take ownership of, I think is also very important. Otherwise, it just becomes one more thing you have to learn about kind of clever people that you are never going to be like. And who, who wants to learn that? Right. right. Or who seems so much more... Uh, regal regal yeah. unified right i mean right gary starts with franklin mccain right who's one of the young people in greensboro um and there are four young people who start mm. it right and so i think in to go back and to think okay i have three friends yeah right what could i do with three friends mm. right because that's what they are they're four friends right and uh go back to uh, Rosa Parks, the story of Claudette Colvin, mm. who's kicked off the bus before Rosa Parks, who pleads not guilty, who's charged, and who they start to go with. But Claudette's very dark skinned, wrong side of town, and then she gets pregnant. She's a 15 year old girl, and they drop her. They just drop her. And they don't just drop her from that protest, which is a strategical question. Uh, also a moral question, obviously, but um, wh what's our test case going to be? They drop her out of history altogether. She's just let go. And when you reinsert her back into history, then what you're saying is you're a single mum. Well, look, this, this is what happened. You're a 15-year-old girl. This is, this is not just what can happen to you in terms of all the bad things they do, but look, she made a stand. She did that. She's part of that story. When they distribute the flyers about Rosa Parks, they say another woman has been kicked off the bus. Claudette Colvin is named. And there's another person who's named too. I can't remember. That's Mary Louise Smith, right. who's, uh, who's 18. And then when they actually file the federal case, right, that, that desegregates Montgomery's buses. It's Colvin, isn't it? It's Colvin, Smith, and two other women, right? Parks is not on that case, both because they're worried that it's going to muddy the waters to have her because her case is still in state court, but also because Parks has this long history with the NAACP and they're worried about red baiting. So the case that actually desegregates Montgomery's bus buses is filed by four women, two of which are teenagers. Mm. And if that, if Rosa Parks is understood as part of a collective action yeah. where she she makes her protest, and then for 13 months, people walk to work. Black people from Montgomery walk to work, without which her protest doesn't really mean much beyond her own protest. Then you, you are involving large numbers of young people, lots of single mothers, lots of kind of working class people like you who made that stand. Whereas if you only understand it as there was this lady, she got tired, she didn't want to stand up, so... She sat down, and that's the story of Rosa Parks. Then you get a sense that, like, first of all, wow, what an individual person. And secondly, maybe the course of history would be different if she just had better shoes. She wouldn't have been so tired. Maybe she would have stood right. up. Right. But, you know, this sense that it's just one person and one moment and not a massive collective uh, uh, protest that involves people like you. Yeah, and what happens when you reimagine this story and not tell it through the lens of the male protagonist right. and you recenter the women at in the, in this fight and you start talking about how what 
what helped launch this bus boycott is the sexual violence that these black women were experiencing on the buses. What happens when you talk when you tell little girls that and when you tell little boys that? What hap- you, you I mean you just you shift the whole narrative and I think that's what you know when we're talking about how do you relate history to young people, you tell them the, the story and you tell them the actual story and you don't give them platitudes. You talk to them as human beings and you give them the truth. Right, and I think you talk about how hard it is. I mean, to me, one of the other, um, I mean, again, every school child learns that Rosa Parks is courageous, right? But what makes it actually courageous is she and other people have done these things before over mm-hmm. and over and over and they didn't work. Mm-hmm. There's nothing to believe that night when she makes that decision that this is going to work and she doesn't believe it, right? Um, she talks about it as her arrest being irritating and annoying, right? She doesn't see this as a new chapter, right? And so I think when we tell the story of like one tired lady sits down and everybody stands up, right? Then it's like, well, nobody stands up when an injustice, mm. right? I mean, it feels like, oh, we're not unified today. We suck today. Um, and when we tell it as they tr- she had done this over and over and over, people she knew had done this over and over and over, right? And that that's what it requires, right? And it requires long seasons of where it doesn't look like anything's changing. And where it's not recorded. Yeah. You know, that where you're not doing it for the cameras or for show, you're, 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 that you're doing it, that history, or well, the facts of history as such, are only the facts that we choose to present. That great E.H. Carr line about Caesar crossing the Rubicon, and he says, well, many people cross the Rubicon, the river, the Rubicon, and Caesar crossed many rivers. What made that a fact of history? And so lots of people made this protest, and Rosa Parks made lots of protests, and it's about what happens in that moment that makes that a fact of history as opposed to the range of other facts. King gives the I have a dream speech many times. And yet somehow we don't know about Detroit. We don't know about the Chicago. So why do we understand the speech in, um, in, uh, in that way? And that does open things up, I think, in terms of um, uh, expectation. Because the expectation is then, I made my protest right. and the world didn't change. Uh, And I made my individual protest, and the world didn't change, as opposed to there were many of us, I made my protest, then we did this, the range of things happened, maybe it didn't work the first time, maybe we have to do it again. So I think we'll take one, there we have one question, and then I think we'll wrap up, and then there'll be time for signing and like more informal. Um, So this says, would Martin Luther King still be marching today? Absolutely. I mean, John Lewis is still out there getting arrested. Why, Why wouldn't King? Uh, yeah, I always, I mean, there is, generally when I do these events, there's always some uh, uh, desire to uh, get you to talk for him. Do you know what I mean? Like, uh, what would he say about this? And what would he say about that? I mean, given everything we know about his trajectory, it would be incredible if he wasn't. He was died supporting a garbage worker strike for paying conditions in Memphis that had gone wrong and where there had been violence and where he felt the urgent need to go back and make it work. I think, um, and it's unlikely, deeply unlikely, that King would return today, would look at the jails and the schools and the mental institutions and um, the food banks and the unemployment lines and think my work here was done. You know, hallelujah. Uh, I, I think the question's less, would he be marching today then? Who would be marching with him? Who would be marching against him? And would anyone even know it? Right, right, right. Right, so eight days after 9-11, Rosa Parks, uh, Terry Belafonte, Danny Glover, and a number of other civil rights leaders uh, put out a statement basically calling for the United States not to retaliate, right, to, to sort of work through the international community to find justice after 9-11. Right, so both one of the great things about setting somebody like Rosa Parks, right, is that she actually lives to the present and we know what she'd be doing because she was, Mm. in fact, doing it. But I think Gary's point, right, which is how many of us knew that? Where was that covered? Right, that we can again have Rosa Parks get a state funeral, first civilian to ever get a state funeral, right? She lies in the Capitol 
King didn't get that. Many presidents didn't get that, right? But that that person had four years earlier said, this is what the United States should do and not do, right? That that part of it somehow falls out. I don't know, last comments? Well, I, I mean, I'd say history is not an objective process. It, it, it works with great prejudice in order to craft certain kinds of memory. Right. And um, those memories are never settled, which is kind of why we're here. Right. And so um, if they can't forget you, right. <laughs> and God knows they try. Right. I mean, it's not like it was a... It was, a foregone conclusion that they were gonna that we would still be talking about King, even if they can't forget you, then they will kill you with the kindness of remembering you in a certain way. Mm. They will kill you twice. Yeah, they'll give you a stamp. They'll kind of um, they will they will deify you in a way that extracts all of the meaning that made you meaningful, and this. Because it's an ongoing process, then that means it's an ongoing challenge. And it's not a challenge that I feel is um, a foregone conclusion. I think that these are struggles that we can actually, uh, I don't know if you ever quite win them, but that um, have traction because they have relevance. And the relevance they have is not just to the past, but to, uh, to the present. That history lives with us. And as much as people like to travel light, when they look around, the baggage is still there. <laughs> yeah, um, to, the, to the point about the, the stamps, you know, Chuck D said, most of my heroes don't appear on no stamp. And they put their pictures on there now, but they still don't appear, <laughs> you know? Um, and, and aside from that, all I have left to say is uh, free Marissa Alexander. Amen. Thank you. Uh, and Gary will be signing books, yes? Yes, and you, I think. Oh, yeah, and me. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank Thanks you. So much.